Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our February On the Air with ODA. And uh, I'm Paul Siem from the ODA Product Management Team. And today we're very lucky to have Prasad Dagol, uh, VP of ODA Development, uh, join us to discuss both the uh, uh, ODA X8 performance as well as ODA 18.8 update. Welcome, Prasad. Hey, thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Okay, so let's get started. This is our uh, safe harbor statement. You know, disclaimer: if uh, we talk talk about anything about the future, you know, it may change. So today we have uh, two uh, very interesting topics. Uh, one is about the latest uh, Oracle Database Appliance XA-2-HA performance. Uh, we published a paper recently, so we're going to uh, talk about that. And the second topic is the uh, the latest. Uh, ODA 18.8 release that's coming out imminently, and uh, so we'll talk about some of the features uh, in that release as well. Then we'll save some time at the end to talk, to answer questions um, if you have it, uh, you know, on the presentation. Okay. So let's get started on the performance. Um, this is just to to uh, refresh your mind on the XA model family. You know, we have the three models: the S. M and the HA models. So today's presentation on the performance is primarily focused on the, uh, the HA model, right? So as you can see, um, it's our um, high-end model that uh, consists of up to 64 cores, actually 64 cores, and the memory could be expanded to one and a half terabyte, and uh, storage could go up to about 369 terabytes of SSD, or the high-capacity version that goes up to 500, over 500 terabytes of uh, HDDs. Now, the performance paper is primarily on the SSD because that provides the best I.O. performance uh, for the system. So, so we're going to focus on the SSD performance today. Okay. And uh, so before we dive into some of the performance details, I just want to kind of bring out things to consider when, when, when we discuss the topic of performance, right? Because this comes up a lot. You know, customers want to do POCs to benchmark things. And I just want to point out things to, to think about before approaching the topic of performance. So, um, you know, the, obviously you have to figure out, you know, talking to the customers about, you know, what are their requirements, right? You know, are they trying to do transactions, you know, um, how many users are they supporting? What's the latency requirement? Or are they doing data data warehouse, decision support, or then where um, large sequential um, I.O. operation is more important, right? The megabytes per second. So you, so you need to understand kind of what the requirements are. And then, uh, of course, it's a complex topic because there are many factors that really affect the performance, right? So that's always a, a not an easy discussion, right? And why is that? Because if you look at the, you know, uh, customer's environment, right, there's hardware components, software components, so all these configurations need to be taken into account when, when performance is discussed, right? What kind of CPU do you have? Do you have? How many CPU cores? Uh, how much memory are you using? You know, what kind of storage are you using? How much storage do you need? Um, what kind of network do you have? You know, or, you know, is the network the bottleneck, right? These all... Uh, environmental factors that affect performance, right? Now, software is also a big part of it, right? What, you know, what ver what release of the operating system it is, uh, which version of database it is, what patch level. So those all have performance implications, right? Even down to what's your block I/O size, right? Are they matching, you know, from one software layer to another? So these all have effect on performance. And then, you know, what kind, what type of workloads, right? Are we talking about transaction based or, you know? A large scan, you know, decision support warehouse type of application, or a number of users you need to support. And then even something like a percentage of read versus percentage of write, that also has imp implications to performance. So here, Prasad, I want you to maybe comment on, um, you know, because ODA's value proposition is very simple. So how do we reconcile with, um, you know, sort of uh, complex uh, performance topics? So that's actually an interesting topic um, because what you described now was all the physical components that we can manage. We can have a clear understanding of how those components work and we tweak them. But one area that we, from engineering point of view, can't really control is the customer environment, their workload, what kind of applications they're running on the system, 
and those affect your database performance dramatically right so if you have uh, a noisy neighbor situation right you, we, we could publish performance numbers based on the hardware limitations or capabilities the system has but if they're running applications that we don't control it's really hard to predict how the system would perform so when we're evaluating a system like this we got to look at all those aspects so that we have a clear understanding of what we're going to get out of it right right yeah that's that's a great point because that lands itself nicely to my next chart so um uh, like you said we have control of the, of the hardware software environment but we don't know what the customer is going to put on the system right so um so this white paper we just published on the XA uh, HA performance um, actually can be a um, reference that customer can use to compare their environment to the ODA environment because in this white paper we document how we set up the uh, uh, the benchmark right using the, the swing bench tool that uh, has all the detailed steps. And then obviously, so these are additional considerations of when they're comparing ODA to their existing uh, system. Um, so we so want to make sure that, um, uh, uh, like Prasad said earlier, you know, all the environment, you want to get as close as possible, understanding that it may not be possible to have an identical environment, but you, you try to get as, as uh, close as possible so that you know, the, 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 the com when you compare the results, they're, they're more meaningful, right? Because if you're comparing apple to oranges, then um, the, the test of results will, won't be that useful. Um, so, uh, go ahead. So, uh, Paul, I was looking at your slides, and that thought just occurred to me that you say raw IOs are mostly what the hardware can achieve. Right. right. Why is that? Right. Okay, yeah. So, so yeah. So, if you look at the second bullet, we, we talked about the raw IOs, and... Uh, what happens is this is kind of the, almost like theoretical, right? You can benchmark, you know, how many IOPS from a, from a uh, uh, SSD you can you can obtain, and that's very easily uh, shown and duplicated, right? But what's uh, harder to predict or describe is some of the software components that have a big impact on performance, right? If you have, you know, mismatching I/O block size, that's going to affect your performance dramatically, right? Those are parameters you set in the operating system or you set in the database. So that's why, you know, the raw IOs, even though it shows you kind of what the, the hardware could deliver, but that doesn't necessarily mean what the, your, your application or the database will see uh, in terms of performance numbers. And we'll, we'll, sh we'll demonstrate that in some of the numbers uh, from, from our, our white paper. Okay? Great. Um, so, so here are some assumptions where you're comparing your your a legacy system versus the, the ODA because we um, performed the, the, uh, using some of the, the tools to measure the database workload and get the results. In order to to make the comparison meaningful, what you need to do is uh, you know have uh, uh, identical identical as, as close as possible the workload, right? So here you can use the Swing Bench, which I'll get into a little bit. Uh, how to set it up, and uh, again, the, the the white paper actually document exactly how how to set up the, the workload uh, for for the environment. And uh, say, so Paul, I'm I'm sure I can. This question has been uh, people are mulling about it on the on the session. You have a second bullet there which says we need to have identical workload to ODA and legacy environments. Right. Like ODA is a modern hardware. Is it fair to create that kind of a workload? What does it really mean? Like, how do you help these guys understand how to create an identical workload? Right, right. So, so that's a very fair question, right? Because uh, it's um, uh, really not fair to compare something uh, that's available now versus something that's available five years ago. Now, but, you know, but a lot of our customers go through the hardware refresh precisely because they understand that, you know, the same amount, the same level of hardware is going to give you much more headroom and performance um, and that's why they're, ref they're refreshing their hardware. And I'll get into some of the measurements we actually have in the later slides to, to demonstrate, even compared to our uh, ODA XA system, the, um, the CPU is much more efficient, just even within 12 to 18 months, right? So what a customer wants to do is obviously get more for their return on investment. So this is a tool, but they need to understand that, yes. You're, if you're comparing legacy systems to ODA, uh, obviously, ODA is going to have some advantage, right? But customer could use that to to 
to size the, the, the new system properly for their workload, right? And, um, uh, and, you know, most of our customers don't keep their hardware for more than four or five years anyway, right? So this is a, a, just an ongoing process, okay? Uh, let's see. Uh, so the other thing is, you know, obviously the software stack, you also want to make sure it's as close as possible. Same operating system, same, da same database is released so that, um, again, the comparison results are, are more meaningful than if they're not. Okay. So let, let's look at the, um, th this again is documented in our white paper, you know, the process of doing this benchmark, right? Swingbench is a tool, it's a Java-based tool that produces workload on a, on a database. So, so we, the white paper actually, you know, set up the environment for you, tell you exactly how to set up the Swingbench, and then uh, configure the environment, and then, then we run this workload. And then we take the measurements once we reach the steady state. You want to make sure it's, uh, it's not in the transient state, which, you know, again, you know, the data is not as useful. Um, and then we tested OLTP workloads and DSS workloads. And uh, then we, we repeat the test with multiple CPU configurations. So this way you can, you know, see the scale up scenario um, uh, uh, with a different amount of the CPU, okay? Ah, so, so this is our uh, performance results. Um, so as you can see, uh, on the OLTP workload, we're measuring, you know, over uh, 37,000 transactions per second. This is a, you know, fully loaded uh, ODA XA uh, HA system. And on the DSS workload, we can complete over, you know, close to 33,000 uh, uh, reports or transaction in 30 minutes. So these are the, the measurements we use to uh, 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 to measure the, uh, the performance. And this is using the swing bench with real 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 uh, database uh, workload so that uh, it's more reflective of what you would see in a real you know customer environment, right? Database environment with an application performance. And we'll also make sure that it does not saturate the CPU, so it's under 62%. And then, uh, uh, Again, and also not keeping, not, not saturate the IO capacity as well, so that they still have some headroom, you know. But still though, and I just want to point out that we also published the X7 performance white paper with the same test, but it's really not apple to apple comparisons because the different environment, you know, number of CPUs. But I just want to point out that if you look at that X7 paper and the XA paper, even though X7 has actually a little more CPU cores, like 72, these numbers are better than the X7 uh, uh, number with, the, with just 64 cores. Again, this comes down to that uh, per core performance improvement that, that I'll show you in a later okay. slide. Um, and then we're doing, you know, close to, you know, 2.2 million um, uh, IOPS. Again, very powerful system and almost 22 gigabytes per second. So, um, uh, so again, you know, a very high performance system. So these are impressive numbers. You're going to give more details? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So here you can see the, the different um, uh, uh, CPU levels and different number of users and uh, and, uh, and the associated transaction per second. So, Paul, the engineer in me is looking at these numbers and I was wondering, why have, the, why have you chosen these specific users for different cores? What's the rationale behind that? Right. You know, the uh, performance is all about trade-offs, right? So, sure, you could do 1,200 people um, uh, with eight cores, but what's going to happen is the uh, the latency, the response time is going to lengthen significantly, again, because, you know, it's just think of it as a, a pipe of resources, right? So so if you don't um, increase the, the pipe, you know, something's going to get, right? It's just a like traffic condition on freeway, right? So with 64 core, so, so what we want to do is maintain reasonable response time. So that's why we have to size. That's why you know we size. You could support more users in small cores. Well, that's an interesting way of looking at this, which basically allows people to figure out if they have a requirement for a certain number of users, right. they need to translate that to the cores and right, right. give them good ideas to what they can expect. Yeah, exactly. This is provides a good sizing metric. You know, people can look at that. Okay, if I need this many transactions per second and I have this many users. Then this is how many cores I need to license. Okay. Um, same thing here. Before you ask the question, you know the number of user changes. In this case, we want to make sure we don't oversaturate the CPU. 
CPU, right? So we want to maintain the 80% uh, CPU utilization. So therefore, we need to have more and more cores to support additional users. So it's, a, it's a, the, the same trade-off, okay? Um, now, earlier I talked about how is it possible that XA with um, uh, 64 cores outperforms X7 with uh, 72 cores. So this is the reason why. Uh, this is a internal uh, benchmark we did in the performance group that really look at the kind of per core performance. Now, as you know, with XA, the, uh, the spectrum mitigation is, uh, is uh, implemented in the in the hardware. So that um, uh, whereas on the X7, you actually have to do that in software, so it's not as efficient. So here we uh, uh, use custom SQL scripts. Uh, looking at again per core performance, and these are the measurements you know in milliseconds that that we uh, measured. Again, these scripts could be available, and uh, so we did these. Uh, again, this is a real database workflow uh, uh, with these operations, right? So you can see the efficiency of per core performance that it ranges. You know, you can you know the 1.3 is uh, 36 is kind of outlier, right? But it's typically between you know 10 to 13 percent. In our measurements, right? So these are measured uh, performance improvement per core performance improvement, and this is consistent with Intel published data that shows the the the, the CPU XA use uh, versus the the one that X7 use uh, with the mitigation with the spectrum mitigation is that um, uh, it's about 15 to 20 percent better per core performance. So so again, this is why XA could outperform the X7 uh, with fewer cores. So in, in essence, you're asking us to look at the per core performance, map that to what the user requirements are with respect to users and kind of workload to right. size right. and assess right. how X8 would perform in their environment. Right, right, right. So um, uh, so again, like like we talked about earlier, where you know newer generation hardware is always going to do better, right? So this is what's happening here. Okay. Now, uh, you know, we talked about how nice the performance numbers are so you know why is that why is older perform so well so i want to just kind of highlight some of the reasons right so first of all this is one of the few systems that are designed by oracle database group you know oracle database developers right so we know how to do database right so that's 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 number one reason you know how to optimize the performance for database and then if you look at the oda uh, architecture it's also uh, part of the performance advantage, right? The, the architecture is actually very simple. Uh, we we don't have fancy rate controllers or CPUs or cache in the storage, right? It's all direct attached, just a bunch of disks, right? Even when you add the second shelf of storage, that the SSDs, they're dual ported, uh, they're still directly connected to the uh, motherboards, right? So the, again, no cache controllers, no RAID, um, so that really simplifies, so you could get the maximum I.O. through the I.O. subsystem, just because the only thing connecting to the motherboard is the uh, the SAS uh, uh, cable. Um, the third reason is that we have many of the very cool database technologies built in like ASM, uh, where we automatically stripe the data across all the available uh, storage, so there's never any hot spot. Now, Pisa, I know you are head of uh, ASN development before. So can you talk about what's so special about ODA and ASM? I know we have added some value add to, to, to the ASM feature for ODA, right? That's actually a great question, which is we've been working on ASM and ODA hand in hand for years. And one of the key uh, things that we did in ASM was ASM generally was designed as a platform agnostic solution. So there were lots of assumptions that are built into the software where we don't know anything about the hardware. So what we did when we started building ODA was we know exactly how the hardware is configured. And you talked about that uh, just a minute ago about how the storage is attached and whatnot. So we took that knowledge into the ASM algorithms to figure out what is the best way to do allocation to maximize availability. Right? So when you run an ODA on a fully configured system, we ensure that there are no correlated failures that take out multiple disks. And that's on the availability side. And we've also done some very interesting adaptive solutions in ASM that allows us to 
smoothly distribute the IO on all the spindles. All the spindles, if it's HDD or all the, all the SSDs, these are things that we could do mainly because we know how the hardware is and rather than allowing the customers to go tweak individual parts of it, we built it into the software. Right. And this is the whole mantra behind making it an appliance. Right. So we truly built the hard knob that we left it as an exercise for the end user, built it into the code so that the customer, when they run it on ODA, they get the best performance, best availability. And we have numbers to back that up. You already showed some of those numbers, and the customers can run those tests themselves and figure that out. Okay. All right. So it's great to know, yeah, that there are unique things about ODA and ASM that's not available anywhere else. Right? That is correct. Yeah. Okay, so then the last part is really about the, the whole value prop, prop, proposition of, you know, all these are being simple and optimized and sort of have relationships to one another, right? So out of the box, you know, we have these templates that are optimized for the, the different workload types, right? So we're already optimized for you. And then also we set up all the, you know, memory um, structures for you, the redos. So again, you know, no customer um, interaction needed, right? So we just do it, do it. By default, right? uh, and, and I'd like just like to add a couple more points on that, right? So you're right. We have templates, but the way we derive these templates is also through extensive testing, right? Which is you shared some of the numbers earlier. Right. The same numbers. These are not just for publishing these numbers, but we also incorporate that into the template. Right. We know that if we are use it for X number of users, what is the right SGA setting? What gives us the best performance? For right. So all those things are codified into the appliance, which is. Someone else has to do the work. So, right. in case of ODA, yeah. we've done the hard work right. for you. Right. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, part of the proof points is that we have, you know, hundreds of references on our websites now. A lot of these customers really like the performance aspects of it because, uh, um, you know, uh, they actually see it, you know, in the field. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so this is the conclusion for the performance part that, uh, as you can see just from our numbers, uh, that we could really handle, I would say, vast majority of the database workload out there. Um, and we have um, thousands of customers that are doing that now with, with ODA. And um, so with the XA, HA model, you know, we have shown that we can um, demonstrate up to 37,000 transactions per second with over 1,200 users, right? So that gives you a good benchmark on, on what we can do. And... Uh, and on the DSS, we can do over 32,000 reports in 30 minutes, right? So that's, again, uh, this is uh, all documented in our white paper. And then we can deliver up to, if you look at the raw I.O., up to 2.2 2 million I.O. per second. These are 8K block random reads, and as well as 22 gigabytes per second. So, again, I mean, very high-performance system. I doubt, you know, most people can go out and build a system like ours with the, you know, comparable hardware to do it so easily and quickly, okay? So that's kind of the bottom line for the performance. So that's, um, oh, before we move on, I uh, just want to show you there are some references. We have the white paper, there's the link, and then, you know, you can uh, go to the uh, the Swoonbench website to download uh, the Java-based uh, Swoonbench tool, and uh, and then you can just follow the white paper and actually replicate uh, the workload on a, on a customer environment and then compare that to the to the to the white paper results. And I also just want to remind everyone we have this uh, very nice inter this is internal to Oracle the the, uh, the sizing uh, tool that's available in our internal website that you can compare different models. You know, you can say Dell this model, um, you know, and, and and compare it to ODA. So so you can go to that site and look at the information. Just want to remind people that we have that. And of course we have uh, our blogs that talk about a lot of the the technical latest technical news on ODA, and of course our data sheets and, and our, 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 our website, the external website. Okay, so that's just a, some references for you. So let's move on to uh, uh, our latest release, 18.8. That's coming out, like I say, imminently, and um, uh, so it's in the final stage of release. And uh, so, so what's new in this release? Um, so we're going to support uh, storage expansion for both X7 and XA, and then we're going to um, uh, allow adding and deleting network and network interfaces on uh, the XA-2. And then, of course, we have the GUI, the browser user interface option to clean up the patch repositories. 
and then um, and also um, we have this um, uh, autonomous health framework or AHF included. This is the sort of the, the new brand that includes the aura check that we talked about before. So this is just uh, the new branding and then it's, and and aura check is part of this uh, uh, framework now. And uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit. And then finally, using the GUI to uh, to run aura check report. Okay, so that's uh, going into the specific. So here, um, uh, so for the uh, ODA X7 systems, uh, now you can actually, uh, if you need storage expansion, you can actually use the uh, the storage for X8, the the, the 7.68 terabyte SSDs or the 14 terabyte HDDs. Um, but you have two options. You can add to an existing X7 storage, but then the, um, the new storage will get formatted down to um, uh, to the previous uh, capacity. Or what you could do is you replace all the drives, and then you'll get the maximum storage capacity uh, with the new new uh, storage components. So this is uh, nothing new, um, and this is also documented in our, our blog. And then also uh, in 18.7, we didn't support storage expansion. Uh, but with 18A now, we remove that limitation now, so you can expand the storage at, at, at any time now. So that's the first um, uh, new thing with 18A. The second feature is the new feature is the, uh, uh, as you know, with uh, ODA XA, we now support up to three physical um, uh, network in interface cards now. So uh, with 18A release, uh, now you can actually add and delete um, the network network cards and network interfaces using both the command line as well as uh, the browser um, GUI or user interface. And um, so that's a, it's kind of uh, uh, provide nice flexibility for our customers. And uh, in 18.7, we introduced uh, the cleanup uh, of the Apache repository. Again, this is to really conserve uh, disk and storage space uh, the, on the local disk or the system or the boot disk, okay? So because, you know, we have customers that run into uh, um, capacity limitations, so so this is a nice tool to clean that up so that they have uh, more storage on the boot disk or the system disk, okay? And now you can do it uh, from the, the, the GUI, you know, the, the browser user interface, okay? I, I call these the basic hygiene tool capabilities. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And then, um, uh, like I said earlier, you know, the, the Aura check has been rebranded to be part of the Autonomous Health Framework, AHF. So that's also included with our um, uh, 18A release. And uh, you still have to run the run the Aura check manually. And um, uh, but you could also uh, do the report from the from the GUI now. Now, Prasad, um, there's this new thing called adaptive classification and redaction. Do you, can you talk about that? You know, I don't know that much about it. Sure. I, in fact, I'm really excited about this. Right? So this uh, feature came about uh, mainly because of the wide array of environments in which ODAs get deployed. And one of the uh, restrictions that we sometimes see is they're deployed in an environment where it's a very secure environment. They don't want uh, Oracle support or anyone to look at certain PIIs that get leaked into the trace files. So we built this tool, which is integrated into TFA as part of your diagnostic collection, which adaptively figures out what is the personally identifiable information that gets leaked into the system logs, Oracle logs, war log messages, so that when you call into your consultants or Oracle support, you can scrub out all those details mm -hmm. and give them a sanitized version of the logs that way you can be rest assured that your security compliance uh, team will be happy. Right? Right. We've, we've had a lot of customers doing this manually already. Right? We've right. cases where, oh, this is a secure environment. I can give you access to these things. So we felt that since ODA is an appliance, right. and we've treated the infrastructure as an appliance, we should start making inroads into Cap building capabilities that makes this aspect of an appliance management also as close to an appliance as possible. That's what ACR is all about. I'm I'm excited to hear how customers use it, what kind of feedback they run into. Uh, we'll see. Okay, uh, great. Yeah, yeah. This is a new innovation that we have done, which is running on ODA. Right, right. That's great. Yeah. I mean, security has definitely has becoming more and more 
prominent issue for for customers. So so it's nice to to see that. And again, you know, all these things that we're doing for at no cost to customers, right? All these features and capabilities. Yeah. That's great. Okay. And then uh, we have a link on the bottom that that, that you can uh, go to the o, uh, ODA documentation to see the details, right? That's correct. Okay. So um, uh, or a check, you know. Actually, on the TFA, so we still recommend uh, customers uh, or our field uh, SEs uh, when deploying the ODAs, uh, always still check to download the latest version, right? Uh, the same recommendation applies. Before, it was download the latest uh, aura check. Now, we're saying download the latest of uh, AHF so that um, you'll capture some of the known issues past the, the, the initial ODA release. So, so, so that best practice recommendation still holds. Just the, yeah, just the name has changed. Okay, and uh, and with the ATN release now, you can actually generate uh, uh, or a check report uh, uh, through the GUI now, the browser user interface, um, instead of just using the uh, ODA CLI um, uh, from the previous release. So this is how you do it. So again, just make making things easier for our customers. One of the things I would like to uh, add to this, uh, Paul, is. You did mention download the latest one, mm -hmm. and the reason why the latest one matters is as part of ODA development, when they release a particular software, customers run into new issues, and if we discover that they're running into interesting corner cases that can be mitigated by uh, enhancing or a check, we do that out of band with our releases right. to make sure those fixes or those checks are available in or a check. So even though uh, you might be running or coming to 18.5, Right? You're better off downloading the 19 or a check, putting it in place because all the lessons that you learned from all the customers who've already come to 18.5 are baked into the latest or a check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that way, they will prevent themselves from getting into these corner cases and causing additional downtime. Sure, sure. Yeah, this is so. There's a, there's a constant feedback cycle going on between what customers are seeing, how we are incorporating that into our tooling, and obviously all those fixes are there in our latest. Week. Right. And they might not be coming to a latest release, but Aura Check is a way to catch those issues. Right, right, right. So yeah, yeah. So so stay with our best practice recommendation of that. Absolutely. Check, check Absolutely. Okay. okay. So now let's see what else is now. Ah, so these are what's uh, included in the 18.8 release. This will be the uh, our October um, database release updates for um, you know 11.2, 12.1, 12.2, and and 18.8 databases, and then. Um, uh, in order to up, update to 18A, you would have to be from either 18.3, 5, or 18.7 to update to 18A. Um, so this is uh, kind of our standard, you know, stay within a year of our release, right? Now, uh, Prasad, uh, I know that the uh, 18.9 uh, release update is it's either out or it's probably out already, right? So how would a customer, uh, you know, upgrade to the database uh, 18.9. So that, that's actually a very good question. Right? So uh, historically, we've seen that uh, ODA releases are not in sync with uh, database releases, and there are lots of factors which uh, lead to that. And and the primary thing being all the experiments or of uh, tests and validations that you just described as part of the process. That's what adds additional delay on ODA. But customers would want to have the latest database CPU, uh, PST, and whatnot. And this is why we introduced back in. 18.5, this new process called out-of-cycle patching, which allows them to pick up the latest security fixes or PSUs from the database as soon as they become available if their operations require them to come to the latest one. And okay. eventually, when we come up to 18.9, we'll reconcile and we'll, the train, right. the two, right. two paths will merge and life goes on. Okay, all right. So it gives customers a lot of flexibility to pick up the latest one as needed. Okay, all right. So, so they don't wait... wait. They don't have to wait until our, our 18 i release. Uh, that is available. correct. So they can go ahead and upgrade their database. They can go ahead and upgrade their databases as soon as they think they're ready. Right. right. Obviously, there's a little bit of risk associated with it because it didn't go through our own validation and testing right. and performance evaluation right. so that it's included in our package. And historically, we do discover additional fixes that need to be included, right. which we incorporate into our images. Right, right. Those wouldn't be there in the PSUs, but customers will have to go through those testing and validation. Right, right. And, and be, we, be current on the security side of it. Right, right. And, but we will support it, right? We will absolutely support it. Yeah. Okay, great. Great. That's good to know. 
All right. So um, uh, just a reminder, our next uh, on the air with Oda is, uh, you know, usually first Friday, so that will be March 6th, uh, uh, next month. And um, this this is this will be recorded and be available on the on the website uh, in about a week or two. So just want to remind everyone, and you can also look through for all the old uh, older webcasts on on their website as well. Okay. So at this time, I think we're ready for Q and A. Uh, hey, Carlos. Uh, uh, while we're waiting for uh, the someone to ask a question uh, through audio, are, were there any chat questions during the presentation? Uh, yes, uh, Paul, someone is asking, when is the release 18.8 going to be available? So we're going through literally the last stages. We have the final draft. We're just validating, connecting, uh, uh, putting all the dots, crossing all the T's and dotting the I's. Uh, it's going to come out any day now. Right? So it's been literally in the last stages. Okay. Um you know, I'll, I'll ask a question that was asked uh, uh, about this 18 that I also before Paul. It, it's uh, since we're going to be able to mix network cards in 18 that I for the ODA X8, are there any changes that are going to be made for the ODA X7 customers, or will it remain as it is? The X7 will remain as is. Okay. So there's a couple of other chat questions. Um, so what is the OVM version of 18.8? Oh, the, we'll have an OVM version along with the bare metal release on, at the same on the same day. And so we're, the OVM release is also being worked on. So both of them will come out on the same day. Okay. And there is another question. Uh, the managing of the network interfaces via the GUI, is it only for bare metal or for OVM-based configuration also? Uh, at this point, the OVM-based configuration does not have a GUI, uh, the, uh, the web interface that we expose. Uh, so as of now, it's only for bare metal. Okay. And that's all the questions in the chat for the moment. Okay. Operator, um, any other um, audio questions at all? I show no audio questions. Okay. All right. So, uh, okay, let's see. There's another question on the chat, right? Um, yeah, it just came in. <clears throat> so it says, we didn't discuss the Linux 7 and upgrade availability. So Linux 7 uh, upgrade will come in as part of our 19X release. 18.8 oh, is still an OSX uh, based platform. And when we rebase our ODA platform to 19X, it'll be Linux 7. And customers who want to uh, try out our 19X releases, 19.5 is already available for them to download roll it out in their test and dev environment to validate um, what changes that they need to make. And Linux 7 is different. It changes a lot of OS tools also change. So it's definitely useful for customers to try out our 19.5 release that's already out there. And soon we'll rebase the ODA to using OL7 uh, and the you know, UAK5 to support the, the Oracle 19 release. Okay. So... So that answers the, the next question, right? When is the 19C database is going to roll out? And you just answer with a 19.6 release. Yes, that's going to come out in 19.6, and we are working on it right now. Right. Yeah. yeah, but if a, if a customer want to test 19 uh, uh, C database with uh, Linux 7, the 19.5 image is, is available, so a customer can download that and run tests on it. And Paul, that's the last question on the chat. Okay. Um, all right. So there, uh, I assume there's no more audio questions either, right, operator? No questions from the audio. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for attending this webcast, and we will see you in about a month. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.